that the classic Darwinian model of evolution and the classic teaching of history has been so abruptly distorted, and now everything is coming into the open. I've quoted the words of Jesus, that there's nothing that's been hidden that isn't going to be made known. And I think this applies especially in the area of archaeology, of antiquity. The point being, Sheila, is that, as I've said before, Genesis 6, in describing the fallen angels coming to earth and mating with earth women and producing giant offspring, genetically corrupting the animals and producing hybrids. See, myth and legend and oral tradition aren't the result of peyote experiments because you've got so many different manifestations, representations, and the actual chronicling of these events, even to the point that it's without argument. Now, you asked me a question. Thirteen years later, after the first edition, I came upon a manuscript I did not know existed. I've reproduced a couple hundred pages in my book. Uh, so people say, how much of the Genesis 6 Giants Volume 2 or Revised Edition, you can call it Volume 2, I didn't put that on the front of the cover, but I would say 60% of it's new. There are 165 illustrations and just, I would say this, magnificently laying out the history of the world. Now, why is this critically important? I want to deal with three words, and you know that I'm kind of a lone voice out there at this moment. You know, I had, a, I guess you'd say, a, an amazing revelation just after writing all this stuff, and, and everybody uses a word Nephilim, okay? And Nephilim is used only two times in the Old Testament, translated giants in the King James, but it's in Genesis 6 and in Numbers 13.33. Now notice the 3.33 both before the flood and after the flood. And that's where everybody misses it, because then they want to quote to me, well, uh, you know, no place does it say that there were giants after the flood. Well, where do you think uh, Goliath came from, King Og came from, the Zamzumans and all of the Anakims and everything that ends in I am? Those were tribes of giants in the land of Canaan. Joshua and Caleb said that we were as grasshoppers in their sight. So it's important for people to understand that we serve a supernatural God. The power of God must return to the body of Christ, the literal followers of Jesus. I don't like to use the word Christian any longer because it no longer means anything with the mainstream manifestation of Christianity accommodating all manners of evil. So I want to give three words. Okay, Nephilim, only two places in the Old Testament Genesis 6, and it says there were giants in those days and after those days. That means before the flood of Noah and after the flood of Noah. People have got to understand there's another word called Rephaim, R-E-P-H-A-I-M, one version of it, Rapha, is translated the dead. So people are reading the Old Testament, they're reading, shall the dead rise to praise thee, thinking, well, I mean, that must be related to the resurrection. No, it's talking about a category of entities, the Rephaim, which were the giants. Right. When the giants were slain, and then, uh, then I, I'll turn it right back over to you, when the giants were slain, those hybrid spirits became the demons. The word in Greek, demonisimai, disembodied spirit, daemon, and by the way, that's not a, a great name to name your kid. Daemon, yeah. obviously, you know, that's probably a good time for a name change, and I'm not kidding. When I say that, and if somebody's got that name, well, you know, I think they should look it up. But the point being is that those three words are so separate and distinct, and yet Nephilim is used of giants, Nephilim is used of demons. Every time I see other people writing about this, I just cringe and shake my head. It's the basis of Scripture that determines the first usage. It's called the law of first mention of Scripture. So, therefore, I want to lay those terms out. Fallen angels, the Nephilim, do not die. They can change their form. Paul said even the devil himself can manifest as an angel of light. Fallen angel does not die. Now, there's 200 fallen angels that were basically imprisoned in a place called Tartarus, and those were the original 200 angels, as you know, that came to Mount Hermon. But after the flood of Noah, they came a second time, and that's when they began to distort the human race 
the human genome. So the reason why all this meddling is important is to understand that all the headlines of today is the oldest promise in the, the oldest deceptive promise in the book of Genesis is ye shall be as God. You're going to get to live forever, have perpetual sex, be able to tap in, and I, I'm sorry if this is offensive to people, but that's what the promise is. The billionaires want to live forever, and, and the ones that enjoy perversion want their perversions to be basically unending. So the devil comes along with techno-decadence, and that was a term I coined almost 20 years, and then I shortened it to tech-necadence, okay? But the point being is, is that we now are approaching, as the scientists would say, a better man, an uberman, an ubermensch, as Nietzsche wrote. So DARPA, Defense you know, Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, just put out a 30-some page report. It's on my website, yeah. com, and it becomes so obvious in our face. So that's why, in a nutshell, this is so important. This is the Rosetta Stone of understanding ancient architecture that has no modern explanation. It's the explanation for the genetic experiments. It is the root of all mythological and legendary exploits by bigger than human beings, stronger than human beings. And as I've spent 40-some years of my life on this, Sheila, it all, it all, it all goes back to Genesis. So the reason they don't want to talk about it, Sheila, because it demands critical thinking and it demands a response of some kind. Now, the reason I've written about this, and for the record, no one was talking about genetic manipulation. When I wrote Genetic Armageddon, written almost, uh, I think, 17 years ago, okay, then Xenogenesis came along, and I had to bring it all up to speed and let everyone know where it's going. And by the way, I want people to understand this, especially the Christians that obviously take me on in all areas. Look, they weren't around, most of them, writing about this stuff 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. The people that argue with me are Johnny-come-latelys that want to basically take away and distort the message. As Pastor Langford has said, and I have been taught, and we both stand on this statement, the Word of God is the primary, the overriding source of truth. It's not fables, it's not fairy tales. So when Jesus said, again, in Matthew 24, we're coming into that same time period prior to his second coming, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus said men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things coming upon the earth, I don't think people understand the value of that. So I would say to Christians, some of them will even brag, famous TV preachers brag about reading Dake's uh, reference Bible, but then want to, you know, turn their wives loose against me. I'm talking about major televangelists and say that this stuff isn't relevant yeah. when uh, their entire husband's ministry has been based on Dake's reference Bible. And Phineas Dake does the best job of explaining why giants. And, and the whole point is this, Sheila. It was to corrupt the genome of humanity so there would be no human beings left for Jesus to redeem. And basically, again, it would give cause to the devil to attack God and say, but you said there would always be a witness in the earth, and now they're all gone. So that's why, and that's why Jesus said this. I mean, I love the words of Jesus. You've heard me say this so many times, but I love the red-letter words in the Bible. That's what Jesus said. I don't care what expositors say. I don't care what critics say. What did Jesus say? And, you know, there used to be that statement, what would Jesus do? Well, I would come up with one that just says, pay attention to what Jesus said, <laughs> you know? Yet, you know what's fascinating? I have talked to Christians that go and watch some of the most gruesome slasher movies, yeah. and play some of the most horrific video games that are absolutely, I believe, uh, there's a production company in hell, and they, they put these images in the mind of men. Diablo 3 is a good example. And the thing is, is that yet they won't take the words of Jesus seriously. Here's the point. I believe that we are now at that point where there's going to be a revelation that's going to shake people to their very core. Maybe later on the show I'll read you an email I got last night after Coast to Coast. And the fact is, is that to the average human being, it's tough to explain to them that they're in a matrix. 
to the nominal Christian, it's tough to explain to them that they're fed continually baby food, if even that. And the point is, is that Paul, the Apostle Paul said, it's time for you to eat meat and grow up. I'm saying that the events unfolding, and you nailed it, the supernatural events, all of the different archaeological finds that are happening, they're pointing to a far different history than we've been led to believe is what our distant past is. Well, you don't refute it. Basically, it's the same in any anything that's new or uncomfortable. You attack the messenger, okay? And listen, this is what's called core reality. When we're talking about stargates, and obviously Jacob's Ladder is a type of one, the Tower of Babel was basically one, the pyramids that are all over the world. By the way, in Wisconsin, they have pyramids. In the Great Lakes, there are pyramids under the different Great Lakes. And see, all this stuff is suppressed. I actually have a study, and after we're done with the interview, I'll email it to you on sacred sites of Native Americans. And as Tom Horn's been in the Arizona, New Mexico, Four Corners area of the United States, which, by the way, has the largest methane emissions, and what's fascinating to me about that, as you probably know, I photographed Monument Valley and the Valley of the Giants, yeah. uh, both from the air and from the ground. It's on my website, speakwhale.com. But the fascinating thing to me is is that that's the area that seems to have the most voluminous amount of stargates opening. They're seeing what, in my book, Little Creatures, changelings. They're seeing so many events, and, and a lot of the Native Americans are getting a hold of me because I guess I'm one guy that believes them. And so the thing that's astonishing to me is something's getting ready to happen in the Four Corners region. And as you know, I think we talked about it maybe once, but the Grand Canyon, even some of the shows now on the History Channel are coming forth with the fact that Mark Anthony and Cleopatra's son, he took 50,000 people to the New World. Yeah. And that's where they settled was pretty much in the desert southwest. I mean, one doesn't have to be a rocket scientist to see that there are so many parallels to the Egyptian countryside. I've literally had people call me, Sheila, that have left the world of black ops, saying they were on the original excavation teams that excavated the giant mummies with, listen to this, active DNA, and this is what's fascinating, from the Grand Canyon, what Professor Kincaid, I think it was 1918, the Phoenix Gazette carried the story, and basically took them to Area 51. And I've interviewed the pilot that flew a live giant, L-I-V-E giant, out of the Grom. I mean, he was live until a special ops team went in and killed him. And that giant had killed, I guess it was a Marine recon group that was looking for the Taliban in the caves in Afghanistan, and the giant killed them and ate them all. Now, I know that's hard for people to embrace, okay? I know it's really hard for people to embrace. But I think God's people should recognize that there is a source for truth. And so that's why Genesis 6 is so critical. And in my book, Genesis 6 Giants, a revised version, I have gone through and I have put into the original language when it talks about the dead, for instance, in Isaiah, it's the Rephaim. When it's talking about the giants, I put in brackets the Rephaim. I'm trying to make people understand, you call them cotton candy Christians, great term, but the point being is you and I can call, we'll take something obvious, we can call an orange tree a pickup truck. We can call anything, anything that we want if we're deceived. And I believe this. I believe the God of this world, Satan, little g, has blinded the eyes of the Christians, and I believe that God's going to give a period where the veil is rent, where the glasses come off. There's two sets of scales in a man's life or a woman's life, Shiva. The scales that are over their eyes when they're blind, and the scales that are in their heart weighing everything out, and because of fear and unbelief and basically training, they won't embrace the supernatural until they're forced to. That's why the occultists that's why Satanists, that's why those who understand the devil has power, that's why they're trampling underfoot 
the Christians, because the Christians think it's just some kind of, and I mean this, it's some kind of a Sunday party gathering. Now, not all of them believe that, but I'm talking about the big mega churches. I want to make sure that's clear. And I get emails all the time, you're too hard, you're too hard. No, somebody before me needed to be harder on the pulpits because everything changed at one point. And Jesus himself said friendship with the world is enmity with God. He states that so many times, you know. Marvel not. They hated me, they're going to hate you. They hated me without a cause, they're going to hate you. I And you've heard me say this, and I think it's a great... One of those, uh, what Pastor David Langford calls a nugget. Look at the name Jesus now. 90% of the Christians are afraid. Now, they'll call him Christ. They want to make something clear. Christ is his title. Jesus even said, many will come saying, I am the Christ and deceive many. Because everybody wants to put their spin on it instead of understanding that God's word is so clear and so specific. That's wherein lies the problem. Make it simple. The powers of darkness and those who walk in the powers of darkness believe in the supernatural power of Lucifer. The Christians basically don't believe it in their own life. And that's why the scripture says the traditions of men have made the word of God to none effect. Men's traditions rob the power of God from a believer's life. But once the people of God get introduced into the Holy Spirit, and the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, everything changes them. Well, okay, I want to make it clear that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the caves of Qumran. Basically, the Dead Sea is in the area, but the caves were Qumran, and they're basically numbered in fragments on my website. Now, what I'm talking about is my parallel website. SteveQuail.com is a contemporary stuff, the alert streams and visions, but Genesis with a numeral six, giants.com, is my website that basically has in the ancient text, you go to genesis6giants.com and go to the banner and you'll see ancient text. On the ancient text, you'll see the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, by the way, was a progeny of a fallen angel and an earth woman. And if you've never read the Epic of Gilgamesh, it was written somewhere around 2750 to 2500 B.C. And I don't call that before the common era. I call it before the birth of Jesus. The bottom line in this, and I, look, I want to get to it, just always cut through the garbage on top. Right below the Epic of Gilgamesh are the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Giants. Now, these are not books as most people know books. These are fragments. Now, it's fascinating because when you read the Book of Giants, it tells you that not only did Satan and his fallen angels, and remember, the Bible teaches a third of the angels fell with Satan, they corrupted not just women, but they went after everything. In the book Genesis 6 Giants, even the revised one, I forget which page it's on right now, but the point is, is you probably read it. Remember when the guy is bragging about mounting a bull so many times? Oh, yeah. And I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that's why bestiality was so wrong. People don't get it. When God said, if a man sleeps with a beast, he's to be put to death, that's the reason why. And because of this rebellious nature of mankind, I mean, they made bestiality. I don't know if they actually passed a law, but they were voting on that law in Germany. The point is, is that when God sent the children of Israel in the promised land, I've had so many people say, what kind of a God would kill men, women, children? I said, the kind of God that wants to redeem his original creation and will not allow the pollution of his human genome. Every time a scientist takes a swipe at humanity, it doesn't matter if it's Kurzweil, it doesn't matter if it's any of these other guys, the transhumanists, the molecular biologists, they're serving Satan, and Satan's promised them a lie that basically God didn't do it good enough the first time, watch what I will give you guys. I mean, it's pretty tough to turn down perpetual pleasure if that's your thing and perpetual perversion and that's why we're seeing all the pedophiles the children, in the same way that we've aborted close to 60 million babies and their blood cries out from the ground 25 years ago on talk radio when I started, I was talking about this day, I said you'll know you're right at the end times when cannibalism becomes the order of the day. We were talking about this, Sheila, before we started this interview. It should have caused an uproar throughout 
the Muslim world when one of the clerics, I guess he's the head mufti of Saudi Arabia, kind of looks like Sauron, <laughs> you know, the, he really does, made the statement that it's okay for Muslim men to kill their wives and eat their flesh. Did you see that? Unbelievable, yes. So where is that coming from? It's coming from the appetite of demons. By the way, uh, years ago I turned down a very famous producer wanting to know if I would be interested in turning the history of giants into kind of like a big version of Shrek, okay? I said absolutely oh, not. Grief. Absolutely not. So right now when we're on the air, I've got people in different parts of the world that are interviewing some of the most astonishing people. And you know what the central theme is? I mean, these people are boots on the ground. The people that have seen the uh, special operations teams come in, the Vatican's agents come in, they want this covered up. Now, why would classic archaeologists and anthropologists want to cover this up? It doesn't fit the Darwinian evolutionary mode. We're talking about a supernatural event. Yet the people that have controlled education and history, writing the history books, etc., the secret societies have used the hidden knowledge to take their adepts or their students and teach them, if you will, the secrets of the universe and tell them they're little gods, okay? And that's why the Christians are totally unprepared for this. And right back to the statement, even as you know, you get flack when you talk about this. And let me bottom line this, and I'll give it right back to you. The reason it's important is because everything you're seeing in the earth right now, all the evil is attributed to these hidden works of darkness. And as long as Christians live in denial, they'll end up on the dinner table. Now, that really offends some people. They say, well, why don't you just preach salvation, Quail? Why do you talk about all this stuff? Because this is my calling. This is what God gave me, the revelation. No human being can know what I know outside of it came from the hand of God. I use the scripture, a man has nothing except he receive it from above. I can't explain why the Lord launched me down this path. I will tell people an interesting thing. Uh, a mathematics professor ran my Bible codes on my name, and it was interesting, guess where it showed up, and all the passages of giants, the idea of the giants is even secondary to the presence of fallen angels. Fallen angels don't die. The 200 original fallen angels are still bound in everlasting chains of darkness, waiting to the day of judgment, okay? That's Jude chapter 1, I think, verse 6. The interesting fact is, is that after Noah's flood, that's when ultimately these entities, only 200, and I don't know how many angels there are, but the point is that it fell, but it's in the tens of thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands, and I submit, what happens, Sheila, since these entities can shapeshift, what happens if the world leaders we see as human beings aren't? Now, when mm -hmm. I said that one time on Coast to Coast 10 years ago, I was told during that time period that a certain individual got so furious and he was a world leader that he split the throats of two of his bodyguards, okay? Now, the gentleman said he was present. Well, I can say maybe he made it up, but knowing how many stars he has and active duty, I don't think he'd make it up. So here's the thing. There is an unseen hand of evil getting ready to make war on the saints. The idea that 300 thousand of our brothers and sisters and children have been beheaded, have been mutilated, have been burned alive, have been cannibalized, have been crucified, and every form of horror, and I don't even want to go into it, women have been raped to death, and with such gruesome detail that I won't talk about it, I've said so many times when I see a little girl with her heart ripped out and her trachea in her little empty chest cavity the most gorgeous little brunette, her heart ripped out in her trachea, in her little empty chest cavity, the most gorgeous little brunette girl, little baby girl, I think she couldn't have been over two years old, yeah. when I see the boot of a thug taking a Christian baby and ripping its head off, that makes me furious. And people say, you shouldn't be so angry. Well, my answer to them is, if you're a man, you shouldn't be such a meow man, and I'd use the other word, but I won't, and you shouldn't be such a denialist. These people are your brethren. Well, that won't affect me, Steve. I literally had this email. 
So I'm going to bring it up. That won't affect me, see, because pretty soon we're out of here. Oh, that's right. I forgot. They're getting raptured out of here. Yeah, and I said, okay, so you're getting out of here. And then I ask them, and then they get mad. How many people have you led to the Lord? How many of the homeless have you fed? How many people have you literally done the works of Jesus? Like when they say, well, not of works, lest any man should boast. I said, but that's where you're wrong. James said, a man says he has faith. Show me your works, and I'll believe you have faith. Because again, Sheila, the cowardice, and I remind people that nowhere in the Bible did God ever honor cowardice in his people, okay? He can take a Gideon who's hanging out, literally hiding, and basically turn him into a mighty warrior. He can take David, who is killing a giant one day, literally Goliath, and at other times, basically he's running for his life, feigning that he's crazy, okay? And so the point is, is that the factor that changes everything is the presence of the living God in a person's life, first of all through repentance, second of all through the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Look, I was taken on a walk one time. When I got saved, 1972, uh, I didn't know what happened. Obviously, I had my encounter with Jesus face-to-face. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a vision. It was literally in my bedroom. I lived in the basement of my parents' home, going to the university. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I knew nothing, okay? I have to be the purest example of someone so totally ignorant of the things of God because, you know, I've shared my testimony. That wasn't even on my radar. The point being is that I went to an Assembly of God church. The testimony I had was so powerful that, I got to speak all over the state and different places, some around the country, because in essence, it was I was like the organ grinder's monkey, okay? I would share my testimony. The supernatural things would happen. I was in my honeymoon phase. A little did I know the honeymoon would end, and then I'd go into the tribulation phase. But I was walked up a mountain one time by a very prominent Assembly of God preacher. And this guy had had a vision of an angel, etc., etc., And he said, Steve, if you only come in on two things, you can basically, and this is my words, write your own ticket. The two things I would not change on were the pre-tribulation rapture, which is a basic premise of the Assembly of God. And listen, I'm thankful and praise God for Assembly of God ministers because they had an impact on my life. And not all of them are like this one. But also that I had to change on my position on Christians coming under the influence of demons. And I think you've had Pastor John Kyle on, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah, and so so the point is is that John gets it really well. So, fascinating, Sheila. After I turned that down, I went from a somebody to a nobody. And I remember kind of complaining about it to the Lord, and I felt like, and David would tell you this too, that God told him, and the Lord said, now you're ready to be used. Mm-hmm. And I, was, I thought I was being used, you know, and I was, but nothing like what would come to pass in my life after that. So here's what I want to say. There's no greater peace on this planet in light of everything going to hell. Uh, you know, uh, I'm watching this stuff 18 hours a day. It gets worse by the minute, and I'm not exaggerating. Yet I know this. I know that we have a Savior who is more than capable of keeping us against this evil day. I also know that the devil is going to make war on the saints and prevail, but against that is the promise that they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That cannot be done in the intellectual realm. It can't be done in the realm of willpower. It can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. What he's saying is, you can't do it, but I'll do it through you. Right, everything God created in the book of Genesis, and he saw that it was good, okay? And some people get really mad, Sheila, when I use the word bastard. Well, bastard comes, that's what God called the offspring of the giants. So, And by the way, when they say the book of Enoch, or the book of giants, or the book of Adam and Eve, understand these are fragments. And they've been put in, and really, you know, to where they're in order, they're in order. But the fact is, is that if you get that issue, now I don't say that the canon of Scripture, but I do say this, that Jesus and James referred to the book of Enoch. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, Lo, I come in the volume book, it is written to me. Well, the bottom line is, obviously, the law and the prophets, but also Enoch. 
there is supposedly, traditions teaches that the Book of Enoch, there are 360 volumes. And according to what I've been told by the people that know where the majority of those exist, those are kept so secret because there's only two people that I see in the Old Testament that never died. Enoch is one. It says he walked with God and was not because God took him. And the other one is Elijah, who went to heaven in a chariot. Obviously, he had told Elisha, if Elisha sees the departure of Elijah, then he'll get the double portion of Elijah's spirit. And that happened. The Bible says it's given man once to die and once to judgment. Let me make it clear. When the Antichrist appears in his quest for worship, the two witnesses will come on the scene. And if you don't know what I'm talking about in the two witnesses, go to the book of Revelation. Because God literally has two witnesses. They're human beings. Some people have tried to spiritualize that and say it's the Old Testament, New Testament. Well, those things don't die in the streets of Jerusalem. And the whole world gives uh, gifts unto one another and says, Hallelujah, glad these guys are dead, you know. <laughs> now, the spirit of Antichrist is in the land, okay? Lawlessness, the mystery of iniquity. If, if people doubt that there's lawlessness, you don't have to go any further than the presidency, though, and I, I, I will say this, the former White House is now known as a slaughterhouse in my vocabulary. And if you don't think that fits, you just need to understand that even on the National Day of Prayer, the, the prayer of breakfast, the entity in the White House was taking pot shots at Christians. Yeah. I submit, Sheila, that anybody who has even a micron of uh, discernment cannot believe that that man is a Christian. He's not, okay? Go on YouTube, do a, a search on uh, Obama's statements about Christianity. Didn't Jesus say, the tree is known by the fruit it bears? Yeah, and that's why people don't understand. The reason history repeats itself is because it's scripted by evil. God intervenes in the, his people's lives through prayer. You know, the old statement, prayer changes things, okay? Jesus was trying to teach his people, his disciples, that there's a different way to approach this whole issue, an essence of uh, just having to deal with what the devil, you know, dishes out. So in my book, Genesis 6 Giants, I want people to, they go on my website, and they can order it there, but I want you to look at the size of the guy sitting on the temple is Zeus. Zeus has nothing to do with the name of Jesus. I'm so tired of that argument. Look, before all things, Jesus was. They say, but there is no J. I got news for you. The scripture in the book of Acts talks about there is no other name under heaven given amongst men. And Jesus didn't die for the angels that sin. That's what, you know, people have got to understand. The book of Enoch, when people read it, and again, ladies and gentlemen, you need to do your homework. I've done mine, and probably one of the most uh, striking things, Sheila, that I didn't know 12 years ago, 13 years ago, was the amount of ancient evidence to some of the characters out of Greek mythology. For instance, Pol Polyphemus, who was the Cyclops, or three Cyclops, and he was like 400 feet tall. Well, the Colossus of Rhodes, which is one of the ancient wonders of the world, there are bones that have been taken. Look, you can understand this. People would have to say, what changed when there were giants in those days versus no giants in these days? And my answer is the control of the truth until the time the truth and the information that it represents can be distorted. They're going to claim, and it's already going in the in the press every day, 10 to 20 years, NASA spokesman says we're going to find alien life. That's horse manure. That is pure mind-controlled, psychological operating, neuro-linguistic programming. It's, um, I'm trying to be tactful here, you know. It's poop of the highest magnitude, okay? It's amazing to me. Christians will get more offended over one word than they'll get offended over watching YouTube videos of our brethren having their heads sawed off. Yeah. Or, you know, children having their hearts ripped out. Or babies having their head torn. You see, here's how it goes, Sheila. If I don't look at it, I don't have to deal with it. Nothing boils my blood more than that. Well, I run at 200 degrees, so I don't know what you're... But <laughs> I agree with you, okay? Uh, I, I'm serious, you know. I, I've had people with PhDs and doctors of divinity 
send me emails and say, you never finish a thought. You just basically are random. Of course I'm random. I tell people that. I'm not trying to hide it. But, you know, one guy, and he's pretty famous, he railed me over the coals, you know, my blood's boiling, okay. But at the end of his railing, he says, me and my fellow scholars don't understand the fact that God would use someone like you, Steve. And I did say this. I said, look, I'm impressed. I got a thermometer that's even got more degrees than you do. But guess what? The <laughs> thermometer, at least, and I did say this, knows the difference between hot and cold. You guys obviously don't. Absolutely. And it's interesting that the forbidden is hidden, okay? And the word occult, when you occult something like when, a, when the moon goes into its occultation phase, part of it becomes covered, okay? So the interesting thing is Jesus was basically saying to the occult, your activities and your power and your place in history is not going to stay hidden. You remember hearing me, Sheila, and this is critical. I tell people, if you understand Genesis 6, God will open up to you your understanding in such a way that everything will make sense and you'll be empowered. Because, listen, I, I share with people all the time, I said, sometimes maybe it's God. You want to blame me, but maybe it's God scaring the hell out of you so he can get heaven into you. And I stand by that statement because, again, my effectiveness is basically now uh, answering the questions nobody wants to deal with. I basically don't have a fan club. I tell people this. There is no such thing as a good Christian. There are only redeemed ones, okay? Even when Jesus himself was called good master, the Lord rebuked the person calling that and said, don't call me good. Only your Father which is in heaven is good, okay? And so there's a moral foundational truth and even though God has forgiven me of all of my sin, I still stand in awe of his holiness, of his justice, of his love and forgiveness. You want to know the difference between Islam? still stand in awe of his holiness, of his justice, of his love and forgiveness. You want to know the difference between Islam and Christianity? The simple word, love. You know, I got news for you. Pretty soon they're going to run out of people to chop heads off, and then they're going to chop each other's heads off. And people say, well, where is that? Obviously, think of the Iraq-Iran war. And by the way, as, as this thing comes to pass in Israel, the nation of Israel that now manifests itself, whether you believe it is or isn't, that doesn't matter. Zechariah 12 just got fulfilled. And now isn't it fascinating that every single nation of the world is turning away from the U.S. dollar? Remember, Sheila, hearing a couple of years ago, I said America will become a hissing in the nation's nostrils around the world. Right. We are so held in contempt. And by the way, people had better realize that, and I tell Christians this, unless you repent, if you voted for the entity destroying your brethren worldwide, who never even said anything about the 147 Christians slaughtered the very day of the prayer breakfast, i got to tell you something. Unless you repent, the blood's on your hands. You cannot take the three-monkey approach. You cannot say, I hear no evil, I see no evil, and speak no evil. No, your silence will condemn you. And see, this is the thing. Jesus said, if the salt loses its savor, it's henceforth good for nothing. So what I've done, and you, you read the last chapter of my book, I always submit every single footnote, every single historic perception under the Word of God. Yes. This stuff is not on top of the Word. And, and somebody says, quit talking about that Jesus stuff. My answer is always the same and has been for 25 years. Who do you think called me to do this, and who do you think gave me this stuff, and who do you think continues to give me revelation? Because I'm, I'm called to warn the people of God. I feel I've done that. And Sheila... I'm really believing God for a new opening of ministry. So what am I working on? I just cherish everyone's prayers. The History Channel and all of the different Discovery Channel and all the knockoffs, they have contacted me at one point or another wanting me to go on screen and talk about giants. When I talk to their producers or the directors, they always have the same thing. It's aliens, it's aliens, it's aliens. I am a student of Zachariah Sitchin. I know and have read all his books. But where he missed it is they would claim that the Anunnaki, they could accept the idea of aliens and accept the idea of angels. Yeah. And angels a messenger. 
So the point is, is that I have read all that. So right now, by the grace of God, we're trying to get a series of six one-hour specials. Tom Horn's going to run them on his new Skywatch TV to put a systematic understanding of the Giants from a biblical standpoint. We're not tracking down elongated skulls. That stuff's important. We're tracking down the reports in contemporary days of live giants, whether they're the ones being seen going up the volcano in Mexico, and that's on, what, Popo Capital, or the ones in Peru, or the ones in Afghanistan, or the ones in the area of the Solomon Islands, you know. And I maintain that with all the earthquakes happening and with all of the seismic events and the cosmic events taking place, as the ice melts, I mean, there are pyramids in Antarctica. Good night. So the point that is really critical is Genesis 6 Giants is my singular most important work. And more people who were skeptics, atheists, and agnostics who thought Christians were just a bunch of crazy, believe-anything people, it lays out foundationally going through, and I've said this, I can speak for 12 hours on Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, because there's a period when God says replenish the earth. And I'm aware that people want to argue over the gap theory, so let them explain the table of kings that goes back a quarter of a million years. Let them explain the map of the creator that's 600,000 years old. Let them explain the cave drawings that, that are 30,000 years old. And it used to be stated that Neanderthals were part of the human lineage. Now they find they're separate and distinct. You see, the bottom line is modern uh, anthropology believed lies for 50 years, believed lies on Peking man. And, and the point is, is that there came a time where science, and I think you've seen this, even the pharmaceutical industry, they're coming out with the fact that, hey, these guys don't do the studies. They fake them. So if I tell people Genesis 6 is absolutely, let's call it what it is, it's a portal to the past, it's a crystal clear mirror of how things happened, and that's what explains the appearance of technology. I can take people back in the world of ancient India in the Sanskrit text. And by the way, one of the most fascinating things to me were that there was a big aerospace meeting of all the leading astrophysicists and everything, and the Indian delegation showed up with Sanskrit and basically the Vimana flying machines, the propulsion, blueprints, how they built them, and everything else. It is, and where we're at right now is people can mock and scoff, but we are in the days of Noah. This stuff's coming back. Men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of looking after those coming, those things coming up on the earth. It's interesting. As the things are coming up on the earth, we also have woe unto you inhabitants of the earth because the devil, your adversary, has come down. And I'm quoting this, you know, not in in uh, the complete word for word. I'm just doing this quickly because uh, I think we're running out of time. But when when the devil gets thrown out of the second heaven where he currently occupies, then all hell breaks loose on earth. So we're seeing right now, Sheila, and I would encourage everyone to go to my Genesis6Giants.com website. Withhold their skepticism, their cynicism, their slander, their assault, and start doing their homework. As you know, Sheila, Genesis 6 Giants, the revised, updated, expanded version, I have enough footnotes, and I'm not trying to be just cynical, but I do have enough footnotes that basically would make a herd of elephants happy, you know, I mean, or, or whatever, because there are just so many footnotes. You see, again, I've done my homework. I'm only asking people to understand, and this is why if you understand history, ancient history, and how it played out, you'll understand the events that are going to play out it, it basically in the future and are now obviously playing out. In two weeks, it goes for 40. I like to give people the ability to save money. And, it, you know, this is an amazing book. Obviously, when you see even the Indians being chased by the giants shooting arrows after them, Magellan, you know, the giants in the New World, the, the point is, is that there's just so much information and seriously, this, in my opinion, and if, if you don't know what the Rosetta Stone is, go look it up, R-O-S-E-T-T-A. It's a way that, uh, with a stone that deciphered ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics into the contemporary languages 
so people could read hieroglyphics. That's the basis of Egyptology. Understanding Genesis 6 is absolutely the root of evil, the explanation of technology. The Book of Enoch says that the fallen angels taught all manner of science, and the science books, by the way, that the fallen angels, they left libraries of their writings, and that's for another time, another state. But please pray for our expedition that's going on right now in South America. When you hear the stories that are taking place in real time, Sheila, I'm telling you what, you ask me what blows my mind, this is blowing my mind, and we'll go on and, uh, you know, bring the guys on that went down there. It's going on in active real time. Pray for the safety. Pray for the revelation that God wants to bring to the world through their efforts. And I just thank you, Sheila. Bless you in Jesus' name. And ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have been emailing me telling me to, you know, continue to sponsor Sheila, I'd like those of you, and I will, but you need to get behind her too. I think she's probably one of the most intelligent, I'm not saying this to flatter you, intelligent voices. Look, we all miss it as talk radio show hosts. I wish I could go back, Sheila, and withdraw some of mine from 15 <laughs> years ago. But the point is, is those of you who have sent me emails, I'm asking you to step up to the pump. Those of you that have been blessed, especially women, I know of no other talk show host who is a woman that gets the big picture. I, I, and the pun intended on the Giants, of course, but the idea is, is that, look, please, people, please, those of you who enjoy, this stuff costs money, and it's not about, it, it's just about the vehicle. If you're blessed, support the place that you're blessed, because that's the best use of your funds. Those of you that don't go to a church, listen, use offerings to support Sheila's show. Step up to the pump and be blessed in the knowledge that there are people that are listening to us. And when she goes on the different uh, venues that God's opening up for her, those people are going to be one to the Lord. And seriously, I, I, I thank people. I said, your gift made the difference in tens of thousands of people's lives. Jeremiah Farrell, a good example. But the bottom line is this. Fight the good fight. Psalm 91. Fight the good fight of faith. Because of one man's gift, God used that one man, bless him, he gave a tithe to Jeremiah, and it was 